Welcome back everybody to our course Introduction to Quantum Optics. Today we want to talk about density operators and the density matrix. It's a more general way of describing states for our two-level atom beyond the Schrödinger formalism that we've encountered so far. So let's get started. So what's the problem that we're trying to address here? So imagine um, that me as an experimentalist, I'm trying to do the best as I can to produce like a perfect source for my two level atom states, but let's say, well, I'm just not succeeding. So I'm just kind of having the case where, for example, we have our source here, and uh, this source kind of spits out our atoms, and really I can only do, you know, prepare 50% of the atoms in state one and 50% of the atoms in state two. And uh, so I'm really doing a lousy job in my state preparation, but that's, that's how it is. Let's imagine this is the situation we're facing, and the question is how can we describe such a situation with the language of quantum mechanics? Well, the first thing you might say, well, if it's 50-50 probability in state 1 or 2, why don't we just write it as a superposition state of 1 plus 2? Well, actually, then I wouldn't be doing such a lousy job because uh, now I actually have a perfect state preparation. Actually, now I have a source with which 100% probability emits particles in state Psi, which is just this coherent superposition state. That's really not the situation I want to describe. I really want to describe a situation where me as an experimentalist, I'm creating imperfect conditions in my state preparation. Here actually, we would have a source with 100% probability emitting particles in this pure state Psi. And in order to have that, we actually need to control the phase between those states 1 and 2 to have such a pure state. And this very often is, is not possible or not as good possible in the experiment as we would like to have it. So you might ask, does this phase really matter in describing the quantum states we have? So let's, let me give you a kind of an analogy, an optics problem that you all are quite familiar with. It's the double slit problem and we have kind of light fields emerging here from these slits 1 and 2 and they have kind of circular waves being emitted by those slits. Those uh, waves interfere in the far field and form our beautiful uh, intensity pattern, our double slit interference pattern that we can see here. Now, in order to see such a nice interference pattern, we really have to have a stable phase between the waves hitting the first slit and the waves hitting the second slit. If this phase changes, between the waves hitting those two slits here, then the phase of the interference pattern is actually going to shift as well. So as phi varies here in the source, the interference pattern is going to move in my detector plane. And let's say this phi varies by pi, that we get a pi phase shift, well then my corresponding interference pattern would just be the complementary interference pattern to what is drawn here uh, on the graph and I would get maxima where I before had minima, and where I had minima before, I now have maxima of the interference pattern. So it's really important in order to see a stable interference pattern that this phase is rather fixed between the two sources, E1 and E2. And if it actually is not under the control of the experimentalist, if it fluctuates wildly, so imagine kind of a situation where kind of you know, you just don't have this under control, the relative phase between those two waves hitting those two slits. It's just fluctuating over time between different realizations of the experiment. That means, as I said before, that the interference pattern is going to shift up and down, is going to wiggle up and down, and on average, it's just going to wash out completely. So what we're going to see on the detector plane is a completely featureless kind of pattern, just a shadow of those slits basically hitting the detection screen and no interference pattern whatsoever. We can also see that in a more formal way that the intensity of the light field on our detector screen is just the incoherent sum of the intensities of the two light fields plus the interference pattern. And if this interference term here, this fluctuates between 0 and 2 pi, so if phi fluctuates between 0 and 2 pi, then this whole interference term on average is going to be zero and we're just not going to see it. So any interference phenomena is lost and we're just lost, left with the incoherent sum of the two intensities of the two slits. So in the case where you really don't have control over this relative phase, which happens very often in an experiment, 
you're not going to see any interference phenomena. So this is the whole point and we're trying to address and we nevertheless have to describe situations where we don't control such a phase between states 1 and 2 in our system. So how do we do that? Well, it turns out that the Schrödinger formalism doesn't allow us to describe such a situation. If we would have a 50-50 probability, such states here or states with the other defined relative phase would be the only states that give us this 50-50% probability. So we really need a new formalism, a new way of describing such mixed states of our system. One way to do this is through the density operator and the density matrix that I want to introduce to you now. And I want to remind you of its features. Maybe some of you have encountered it already in your quantum mechanics course. Let me just review then the kind of most important things that are relevant to the course here. So let's imagine again we have a source spitting out particles in state psi i with a certain probability pi i, pi. Then the density operator would just be given rho, the density operator rho would just be defined as the projector onto this state psi i with a probability pi. And the sum of all those probabilities has to add up to 1. So in our situation of 50% spin 1 particles, 50% spin 2 particles, this would correspond to a density operator of 1 half 1 1 plus 1 half 2 2 in the system. As you can see, the rho hat, the operator, the density operator is emission. If you take its adjoint, you get exactly the same uh, density operator back again. And uh, if we expand it in the basis of our system, in a basis set, in our case, the two level system, then we can write the density operator in the following way. Remember, we're using our constant trick of introducing the unity operator. The unity operator, that's just the sum over the projector overall kind of basis states in our system. And uh, so we get kind of this formula here of writing the density operator in terms of its matrix elements rho ij. So this is going to be a matrix size determined by the number of basis states that we have. And for our two-level system, we just have two basis states, so we can expand the density operator into these following operators that we have with the corresponding kind of prefactors given by the matrix elements of this uh, row operator, the density operator. And these matrix elements, the whole matrix that is formed by the matrix element, that's the so-called density matrix that we've written down here then. So this density matrix can describe a situation where we have kind of sums over different states emitted with a certain probability pi. Now, some nomenclature of uh, what we call those matrix elements. So we have the diagonal elements, row, row 1, 1 and row 2, 2. Uh, these describe the so-called populations uh, of the states 1 and 2. So these are the so-called populations of being in state 1 or state 2. And these row 1, 2 and row 1, 2, these are the so-called coherences of our system. And we'll actually see in a second why when we look at a pure state written down in such a density matrix formalism. And because the density matrix uh, is emission, we know that the transpose and the complex conjugate has to be the same as rho, so rho 1, 2 is just rho 2, 1 star due to the emission nature of the density matrix. Okay, so to familiarize ourselves a bit more with this density matrix and the density operator, let's take the simple case of a pure state. Actually, now we wouldn't gain anything by using the density matrix, but just by trying to get to know this object, let's just use it to describe our pure quantum state, psi, written down here with amplitudes norm C1, norm C2, and a relative phase factor e to the i phi. So again now, if I, if I write down the density matrix elements of this pure state, that would give me the populations on the diagonal, which of course for a pure state, that's just norm of those coefficients C1 and C2 squared. And you see the relative phase, how well the relative phase is determined between those states 1 and 2, this is on the off-diagonals. 
So this here is tells me something about the coherence, uh, i.e. the relative phase, how well the relative phase is defined between states 1 and 2. So let's look at a specific example here. Let's take our state Psi being a coherent superposition state of 1 and 2. So the relative phase is 0, but it's constant. Uh, it's well defined. So now if I write down my density matrix, it would just be given by the populations on the diagonal. The populations of being in state 1 and 2, they're just 1 half. So we have 1 half on the diagonals. Phi, the relative phase is 0. So e to the i phi or e to the minus i phi is 1. And uh, norm C1 is 1 over square root 2, norm C2 is 1 over square root 2. So you see actually it also have 1 half on the off diagonals here describing the coherences of your system that you're looking at. Now let's look at the other extreme case when we have a fully incoherent mixture. This was kind of the case we're trying to describe initially in the system where we had 50% for example emission of atoms in state 1, 50% emission of atoms in state 2 in, from our source, but we're not controlling at all the relative phase between those states 1 and 2. So really doing a lousy, lousy job in our state preparation, but that's just what it is. How would that look like? Well, with a density operator I can describe situation, that's just 1 half times the projector of being in the state 1 plus 1 half of the projector uh, being in state 2. And if I write now the density matrix, look at the density matrix of my system, we see we have the same populations as in the pure state case, but we have vanishing coherences. Vanishing coherences of diagonal elements. And this really tells us that we don't have any, any well-defined phase between states 1 and 2. It's fluctuating from shot to shot between 0 and 2 pi and washing out any of this relative phases, averaging out to 0, and we have a situation where this phase is totally uncontrolled from experiment to experiment. So this would be given by the same diagonal elements, the same populations of being in state 1 and 2, but obviously we've lost any coherences. And that would mean also probably that we have lost kind of any ability to do interference experiments and we'll come back to that question actually later in the course. So remember the coherences tell you something about how well you can actually do interference experiments with such a state. So finally let me just recapitalize some useful facts that I'm not going to prove to you but uh, that you might read in any good quantum mechanics book but that we're going to make use of in the following of the course. So if you, for example, want to calculate an expectation value of an observable, this is just given by the trace of the density operator times the operator you uh, want to calculate the expectation value of. And if you now write the density operator and the operator A in the basis of your system, in our case the two-level system, so you write rho is a 2 by 2 matrix, A is a 2 by 2 matrix, it's just the operators given in those basis states 1 and 2, then this is just the trace of the product of rho and A. If you look at the time evolution of the system, the time evolution actually that's just an extension of the Schrödinger equation. So this is the so-called von Neumann equation which extends the Schrödinger time evolution to the time evolution of density operators and you see that's just given the time derivative of the density operator, that's just given by the commutator of the Hamiltonian of the system times the density operator. Finally, you might want to know if your system is in a pure state or not. And there's actually an easy way to check that. If you take the trace of rho squared, so you have your density matrix, you square it, you take the trace, then that equals to 1. And if you have a mixed state, if you're in a mixed state actually, then the trace of rho squared is always smaller than 1. So this is what I wanted to tell you today about the density operator and the density matrix and we're actually going to use that to describe a more general case of light atom interactions in the next class. Thanks a lot for watching. See you next time.